Okay, we're going to um, finish up talking about the presidency. This is the last lecture dealing with presidential powers. We spent part 2A dealing specifically with the express or, or enumerated powers of the president, talking about his military, his judicial, his diplomatic, his executive, and his legislative powers. And we're going to switch gears and talk about his inherent powers, uh, one particular inherent power called executive privilege, and then look a little bit closely at the institution of the presidency to see how he gains some power um, that goes along with just being president. So here's a cartoon about executive privilege that we'll talk about, and these are all uh, figures of Richard Nixon um, and his uh, powers uh, that many people believe and um, were, were um, expanded and abused when he was in the presidency that led to his uh, demise. And so we'll, we'll talk a lot about Nixon and show a couple of clips uh, regarding the Nixon administration to give you the background on Watergate, executive privilege, and how we uh, know about those issues today. All right, so again, we talked about express powers last time. Remember, delegated powers are those powers that Congress gives to the president to carry out the laws. So normally these are associated with the legislation that is passed so that the president has the power to then carry out, for example, um, no child left behind. So Congress passes a law that deals with issues of education. It's the executive branch's office responsibility to make sure that those laws that are outlined, for example, in No Child Left Behind are carried out. So we're going to skip down to uh, the inherent powers. And so the, the most noticed or the most um, notorious, I guess, uh, inherent power is executive privilege. And I have the definition here for you. It's where the president's implied or inherent power to withhold information on the grounds that if I were to release that if I was the president, then it would have some sort of negligent effect on national security or the ability of me as president to be able to do my job. And this is where um, President Nixon got into a lot of trouble. And here is the famous tapes that um, were um, doctored that he finally turned over after he had um, exerted executive privilege, and this is his famous quote, I am not a crook. So I'm just going to give you this clip that gives you um, some good background information and explains to you um, not only the concept of executive pr privilege, but gives you the Watergate um, scenario in about five or six minutes. If you want to see a good movie about the Watergate, then um, you'll need to rent the movie um, All the President's Men. Um, and so that's a, that's a good um, video that, that shows the uh, unfolding of the Nixon administration. This was one of the biggest political scandals in American history. Welcome to WatchMojo.com, and today we'll be learning more about the Watergate scandal. The thing that's so appalling to me is that the president, when this whole idea was suggested to him, didn't in righteous indignation rise up and say, get out of here, you're in the office of the president of the United States. How can you talk about blackmail and bribery and keeping witnesses silent? In mid-1971, the Pentagon Papers were leaked. That report proved that administrations from Truman to Johnson had intentionally expanded their Vietnam War efforts in contrast to what the public was told. The Nixon administration then panicked and formed a covert group to halt leaks. Nixon advisor John Ehrlichman assembled the White House plumbers and included former CIA agent E. Howard Hunt and former FBI agent G. Gordon Liddy. Soon, the president's political rivals were recorded on Nixon's enemies list. Politicians, journalists, and even Hollywood actors Nixon feared could stop his re-election were included and were harassed by the administration with tax audits, legal action, and more. Prior to the 1972 election, the Republicans created a Committee for the Re-Election of the President, or CRP. John Mitchell stepped down as Attorney General to chair that committee. The CRP used questionable and illegal means to achieve their goal. For example, Mitchell kept a slush fund to subsidize information gathering on the Democrats. Ultimately, a plan was approved to bug and steal information from the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel. On June 17, 1972, during the second of these break-ins, the burglars were arrested. The Democratic National Committee is trying to solve a spy mystery. 
began before dawn Saturday when five intruders were captured by police inside the offices of the committee in Washington. The FBI quickly linked those arrested with Hunt. Because of Hunt's connection to the plumbers, Nixon ordered his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, to instruct the CIA to block further FBI investigation into the finances behind the Watergate break-in. The cover-up began. Mr. Nixon, did you know about the burglary of our Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate? The Nixon administration then officially denied involvement in the burglary. However, more clues emerged that conflicted with this. Aside from the Hunt connection, one of the burglars was a Republican Party aide, and a paper trail led to the CRP. On June 20th, Washington Post journalists Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein reported on the Hunt connection, with confirmation from their anonymous source, Deep Throat. This team was instrumental in unraveling the Watergate case, and in implicating the Justice Department, the FBI, the CIA, and the White House. In 2005, Deep Throat was revealed as former FBI Deputy Director Mark Felt. By September 1972, the burglars, Hunt and Liddy, were indicted by a grand jury. Despite connections to the scandal, Nixon was decisively re-elected that November. The burglars pleaded guilty before Hunt and Liddy went to trial in early 73. The scandal soon exploded when many of the administration's important figures were implicated. In April, four top Nixon aides lost their jobs due to their involvement in the cover-up. Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Attorney General Richard Kleindienst, and White House lawyer John Dean. Official investigations began in mid-1973, led by Senator Sam Irvin and Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox. They proved the connection between the burglary and the White House and CRP. Dean became a valuable witness when he divulged Nixon knew about the cover-up. In July, Nixon assistant Alexander Butterfield explosively revealed the existence of Nixon-installed recording devices throughout the White House. Those tapes were subpoenaed. However, Nixon refused to release them, citing executive privilege. This principle of confidentiality of presidential conversations is at stake in the question of these tapes. I must and I shall oppose any efforts to destroy this principle, which is so vital to the conduct of this great office. To save himself, Nixon dismissed the Attorney General, his deputy, and Cox in the Saturday Night Massacre. Public outcry followed, and Nixon responded with one of his most quoted speeches in November 73. People have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. By March, the Watergate Seven were indicted. Many spent time in prison, and though Nixon was named, he remained unindicted. The Watergate tapes were finally released in July 1974. An 18-minute erased section proved controversial. Of the exposed facts, it was found that some involved in the break-in had received hush money. Most importantly, the smoking gun tape undeniably proved Nixon knew about the cover-up since mid-1972. Nixon was forced to step down or face impeachment. On August 8, 1974, Nixon resigned and was replaced by Gerald Ford. Exactly one month later, Ford officially pardoned him. This controversy resulted in multiple arrests, the creation of new laws, renewed interest in investigative journalism, and the first resignation of a U.S. president. The Watergate scandal undoubtedly changed American politics forever. <laughs>
um, the action in Vietnam, and then of course Nixon has to step down in 1974. And so since that time there's been a lot more of investigative journalism as the video clip pointed out, and a lot less trust between the general public and the elected officials, and this is why you see low uh, approval ratings many times of our elected officials as well. All right. Well, we know that there are constitutional sources of power, and we talked about the express powers and then one example of an inherent power, but there's also some power that just comes along with being the president and the institution of the presidency. So regardless of who sits in the office, this institution of the presidency brings with it some power that the president can bring to bear. And so one of those um, in terms of the institutional presidency is all those individuals that work for him in the executive branch. And so of course the president has his White House staff and these are individuals who work with him in the White House um, which would include his chief of staff, the vice president, um, a bunch of other individuals who make up the executive office of the president and the White House staff. So you can see all these individuals that work for the OMB, if you hear about that, that's the Office of Management and Budget, the National Security Council, this is the NSC. When Bush was president, this is the organization that Condoleezza Rice was in charge of. Then you have the U.S. Trade Representative who, who advises the president on all the trade policy, the Office of Policy Development, the Vice President. So of course all this moves upward to provide institutional support and institutional sources of power. And all of these individuals, their key component and what they provide the president is information. After all, if we think about constitutionally, Congress has a lot more um, information at their disposal than the president. So the president has to be able to find out as much information as possible and it's through these different groups that help him develop policy and suggest policy for uh, his agenda. Okay. Again, underneath the executive office of the president, if this was going forward, then you have the president's cabinet. And so these are all the different cabinet positions. And so everyone who heads one of these cabinet posts is the secretary of. So you have the secretary of defense, the secretary of state, the secretary of the treasury. The only one that's not called the secretary of the justice department is the attorney general. So this is the office of the, the justice department's head honcho is the Attorney General. And so all these different positions as um, the secretary position is something that the President gets to appoint and the Senate has to approve. Everyone else that works in this group are, are career bureaucrats that have worked for the Department of Treasury or the Department of the Interior for years and decades and their whole job is to be dedicated to that particular mission of that particular cabinet post. And then there's different institutions underneath um, this particular group um, and different government corporations like Fa Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac that um, are also part of the executive branch. Okay, so this is the bottom part, this is the top part and they all kind of go together to bring information and institutional sources of power to the president. Okay. Um, this is just a, um, a picture to show you. This is President uh, Obama's cabinet. Now, of course, you're not going to be expected to memorize these people, but this is just to point out to you all the different people that make up the d secretaries of this particular groups. So the Department of State, Hillary Clinton is the Secretary of State. Ken Alizar, uh, sorry, Salazar is the Department of the Interior. Then you have Robert Gates, who was the Defense Secretary. Um, I do believe he has stepped down by this point. Ron Kirk is the trade rep, and many of you from the Dallas-Fort Worth area may know Ron Kirk. He's the former mayor of Dallas. Rahm Emanuel was the chief of staff. He is now the mayor of Chicago. Uh, Janet Napolitano, we see her in a lot of the news because she is the Homeland Security um, Secretary. And then you have Timothy Geithner, who you really can't see. He's back behind. Um, uh, Joe Biden, who's the Vice President, but Timothy Gatner is in the news a lot because he's the Secretary of the Treasury. And then Eric Holden is this gentleman right here. He is the Attorney General. And then there's some other folks that represent different um, agencies and the Veterans Affairs, for example. So a lot of people make up the President's Cabinet, and he generally appoints people a position um, uh, as an ambassador uh, or something like that. 
So, for example, John Hutzman, who was running for the presidential nominee for the Republican Party, was the ambassador to China, for example, under the Obama administration. All right. Beyond the uh, constitutional powers of the president and beyond the institutional powers, there are some also some political sources. So not only does he derive power from the Constitution as well as the trappings of his office, but there's some additional political sources of power that the president can rely upon. And one of those is obviously the party. The president is considered the head of his respective party. And so a lot of the work that the party does is on behalf of the president to raise money, to bring the voters out, to organize at the state and district levels. So he has the party to fall back on. There are certain groups that the president um, can, can look to um, as sources of power. So, for example, Franklin Delano Roosevelt really came into office on this New Deal coalition where he was able to put together different groups of voters into a new constituent for the, for the Democratic Party. If we think about who the groups are that support um, President Obama, they're going to be more liberal groups as opposed to who supported President Bush when he was in office. So the New Deal Coalition is just one example under the FDR administration. Obviously, public opinion matters when it comes to the president, and there's lots of ways that the public opinion is manifested, and this is the use of the media. And in today's environment, we have so much social media that um, the president cannot run or hide um, and um, not be aware or, or the, the American public um, is always aware of what the president is or isn't doing. In the days of uh, President Kennedy, and this is Nixon, a uh, much younger Nixon than we saw in the previous clip, Nixon is vice president to Dwight Eisenhower and he runs for the presidency in 1960 against uh, John F. Kennedy. But in this time period, you didn't have 24-hour news media, you didn't have um, the paparazzi following the president around. So the private lives of these individuals was not as um, important as it is today. And so um, what would be considered scandalous behavior today um, probably went on with the politicians um, without the general public knowing about it. But some of this public opinion really started to uh, come to fruition in the 20th century and it really kind of starts with FDR's fireside chats. You know, Franklin Roosevelt is president before the advent of television, and so people sat around uh, their radios and listened to the president give his opinions on things um, on these fireside chats, and that's how he directly appealed to the public. More recently, of course, we have debates that we see on TV. In fact, we're inundated with debates, and we're getting to see a lot of Republican debates in particular because um, no one's really going to debate Obama in the Democratic side of the, the primaries. And so the primaries are where um, we're seeing the Republican debates, but once the Republican nominee is, is made in the late summer, then the Republican nominee and President Obama will be engaged in televised debates that you and I take for granted. But the Kennedy-Nixon debates is the first time that we start to see debates on TV and the, the power of the media and how, it you, how it's used to shape candidates and our impression of candidates. So this is a kind of some classic uh, footage of the Kennedy-Nixon debate um, that's provided in a documentary by the History Channel. I've been doing taxes for 25 years. I've dealt with... Well, after the advertisement that apparently um, we're going to have to endure for 15 more seconds. Tax.com. was the debate that helped decide a presidential election. The date was September 26, 1960. During the 1960 campaign, John F. Kennedy runs against Vice President Richard Nixon, and the image of John F. Kennedy becomes a central part of why he wins. 
A record number of Americans, upwards of 67 million, go to the polls to elect the 35th president of the United States. It's the first campaign that uses televised presidential debates. And we think of these as routine nowadays, but this was unique for the time. Each man shall make an opening statement of approximately eight minutes duration and a closing statement of approximately three minutes duration. And during the debates, uh, one of the most famous stories is that people who heard the debates on the radio thought the Nixon won. And if you watched the debates on television, you believe that Kennedy won. I want to compare what we're doing with what our adversaries are doing. Kennedy is very conscious about image, about how he appears in the television cameras. He turns to the television cameras during the debates. Rather than answering questions to the reporters, he looks right in the camera. And he understands the power of that image to the voter. Whereas Nixon um, never seems to understand that style does matter. Mr. Nixon, comment. It would be rather difficult to cover them in eight and in two and a half minutes. I would suggest... The classic example of this is where he comes in with the five o'clock shadow. He looked disheveled, he was sweating uh, as the debate took place. Uh, he looked as if he was nervous, and, and in some ways he looked like someone you might not be able to trust. And he tells advisors, well, this doesn't matter. What matters is the substance of my uh, message. Uh, I can only say that my experience is there for the people to consider. He had been the most influential vice president in American history up until that time. He'd been very active on foreign policy issues. And he kind of sells the fact he's been in the White House already. Kennedy hasn't. Who is this young guy? when uh, the uh, vice president quotes me in January 60. But Kennedy did have a real advantage. This is an incredibly telegenic uh, uh, senator. And so the Kennedy people realized that they could use this to their advantage in a way that Nixon uh, never really did. And so Kennedy's uh, style advantage over Nixon wound up being far greater than Nixon's substance advantage over Kennedy. Okay, so this whole idea of image becomes an important element for the president to use in terms of a source of power and the power of the media and then public opinion. And so the president is going to work really hard to try and make sure his public opinion rating stays high. And we hear about the president's public opinion rating um, pretty much weekly if you uh, pay attention to the news, um, particularly if it dips below 50 percent, you'll hear that on the news. And so if we think about uh, the question that's always asked by Gallup, and you can see this is from 2010, but um, the question that the Gallup uh, company always asks is, do you think the president is doing a good job? And so you can see over time, um, and this is not unusual, that over time from the time they take office, remember the election was in the fall of 2008, and so this is beginning in 2009 uh, up until September of 2010, that you start to see a, a general decline of presidential approval in terms of, uh, of asking the public whether or not the president is doing a good job. And so you can see uh, the 50 percent line is where there starts to be concern about presidential approval. All right. Um, but then they also look at specific issues. So Gallup will ask about whether or not uh, people believe that Obama is handling certain issues well. And then they will break it down by political party. And so if you're uh, a Democrat, you're probably in favor of how he's dealing with certain issues. And if you're a Republican, you're probably not in favor of how he's dealing with issues. And so this is not uncommon to see that 63 percent of Democrats think he's on the right track in Afghanistan and 74 percent believe he's on the right track when it comes to health care. And obviously, um, you know, he's he's not going to get Republican support in these areas. And I think what both parties are really concerned about is the independence, what their percentage is. And so if you're running for president and you are from one of these political parties, you can pretty much count on your base um, supporting you. What you really have to do is impress this, these folks that are independents to come and vote for the Democratic Party or come and vote for the Republican Party in the general election. But if only 24 percent of independents think that you're handling health care well, then you might have a problem with, with um, getting reelected. And so the independents become a very important constituents, uh, constituency for, for both of the political parties. And we can see again that this is not unusual to have declining support over time as president. And so if we think about um, the, the, the flow of, of approvals, when the president is first elected, and this is Kennedy in 1960, he defeated Nixon, 
you can see over time that the, the, there's a decline. Usually there's an uptick when something happens, and this is the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then it de kind of declines toward the end of their administration. Of course, you know, Kennedy is assassinated, so LBJ becomes president, and he gets support um, right after his reelection. And then it declines over time, and this is the Vietnam era. And so people are tired of the Vietnam War. He chooses not to run for reelection. And then Richard Nixon comes in with the promise of probably trying to end the war. And you can see initial support. And then he gets reelected in 72. And then here's the Watergate era. And so then you have Gerald Ford come in, pardons Nixon. So you have a dip there. Carter comes in on a high and then over time starts to decline. And this is during the Iran hostage crisis. So he has very low support. And you can see Ronald Reagan's at, at a high, and then it kind of dips back up when he gets reelected. And then uh, overall, he, he pretty much has some pretty good support, dipping every now and then. George Bush had very high uh, support. This is during Gulf, uh, the first Gulf War. And you can see it plummets very quickly as he moves toward reelection. And this is because of the economy. Bill Clinton was very successful at maintaining a pretty high rate of presidential support. And we can see even at the end of his presidential term, many people believe if he could have been eligible for re-election, he probably would have been re-elected. And then you can see George Bush at a very high, this is right after 9-11, um, very high support, and it just diminishes over time as further and further you go into a president's um, administration. And so approval ratings tend to decline over time. All right. When we think about the views of the executive, just to kind of wrap up a little bit, he has to use his constitutional powers, he has to use his institutional powers, as well as the political sources of powers that he has. And with that, presidents kind of take two views about their role. There are those who believe they should be a steward of the, the people. And this is the idea that the president has the duty to serve popular interests and doesn't really need specific constitutional or legal authorization to take action. That he is the steward of our country and we should uh, allow him to take whatever steps are necessary um, to make sure that the, the nation is safe. And so people who take this stewardship view are very liberal in their view about how to interpret the Constitution. Constructionists, on the other hand, believe that the president should exercise no power unless it's really explicitly granted in the Constitution. And so most presidents since World War II do not take the constructionist view. They take the stewardship view. All presidents have a common interest. They want to maintain the power of the presidency rather than cede power over to the other branches of government. And so I, would, I guess I would close with saying this fight between Congress and the President in terms of who has more power um, is an ongoing one and issue by issue presidents and the legislative branch try to exert their power respectively. Um, but since World War II the President has expanded the power of the presidency by each generation of presidents. And so the, the power of the President far out ways or outreaches what the founders of the Constitution had envisioned. All right, that's where we'll conclude. Uh, make sure you review the reading questions and the key terms that have been posted. Um, and then the next topic is going to be on the Texas governor next week.